So, let us uh, continue our discussion related to electrokinetics. I think some small uh, mistakes I would like to correct from the last presentation related to the electro osmosis. So, I hope you recollect uh, our discussion on the double layer. So, we talked about um, you can also have a normal uh, water you know which is a polar fluid and also you can have an aqueous solution of uh, some salt you know, such as sodium chloride, potassium chloride in any way. So, you will find that uh, whether you have a polar fluid or you have an aqueous solution of this the because of the presence of a stern layer um, close to the wall. So, you have a migration of all the ions um, which will go towards the wall and therefore, this will set up a concentration gradient. So, in this particular example the wall is uh, uh, negatively charged and therefore, uh, you have the migration of uh, one layer of uh, positive ions could be hydrogen or it could be the potassium ions uh, sticking to the wall and this will also start the migration of the other positive ions closer. So, therefore, there is a concentration gradient number one and uh, this will also result in the electrostatic potential gradient. So, two things are happening parallelly there is a mass transport process there is also uh, setting up of uh, uh, electrostatic potential uh, difference. So, therefore, if you apply an external field of course, uh, close to the wall which where we see, see the significant uh, uh, concentration gradients uh, is where we have this diffuse layer right. So, this diffuse layer will be of the order of a uh, few tens of nanometers. Uh, so, when we solve this problem if you take the case of a, a, a fl flat plate and uh, you look at the uh, picture of a one dimensional uh, velocity profile due to an external electric field. So, you can uh, look at this problem uh, like uh, a case where we saw the slip flows. So, the slip flow case we apply directly the slip boundary condition at the wall and here you can assume the wall is shif shifted up by the order of 10 nanometers. Okay, and uh, we solve for a solution for the inner layer that is for the electric double layer get the solution at the edge of the electric double layer for the velocity profile and apply that as a slip boundary condition for the bulk flow. Okay. So, this is this is how usually the electro osmosis problem is dealt with because all the forces are acting close to the wall and this is a very small region. So, it does not matter if you assume that there is a wall shifted up by 10 nanometers. So, it is not going to uh, disturb the bulk flow uh, profile. So, as long as you can give the right boundary condition correct. So, therefore, the inner solution. Um, so, before we go into the um, inner solution. So, I just want to uh, talk about uh, the concentration gradient. So, what we have assumed is a Boltzmann statistic type distribution of the concentration from the wall to the bulk value which is your C i infinity. So, uh, we are uh, assuming this Boltzmann statistic. So, here this is a function of phi the electrostatic potential this is the ex excess potential. So, this is the difference between the local potential minus the bulk value. So, this is indirectly a function of y the vertical position through the dependence of phi on y right. So, therefore, uh, we can relate uh, your concentration gradient to the net ch local charge density at some location which is rho e as a summation of your concentration um, multiplied by the, ch the charge of that particular concentration um, species times your Faraday's constant. Okay. This gives you the net local charge at that particular point. And uh, this is again a function of y. So, therefore, to solve the overall um, the electrostatic potential field uh, phi. So, you need to solve the Poisson's distribution uh, Poisson's equation where the right hand side uh, is the local net charge density given by this particular expression. So, here you substitute for C i which is the local concentration as a function of the C i infinity from the Boltzmann statistics right and therefore, you get what is called the Poisson Boltzmann equation. Okay. Um, this is a equation this is a field now for which you have to solve for because uh, you have everything as a function of phi 
in the left hand right hand side. Now what we do is this is a non-linear equation and first thing we do is non-dimensionalize it. So we non-dimensionalize it with the following variables, one is a non-dimensional electrostatic potential phi star and the coordinates are non-dimensionalized with the d by length lambda d that is the extent of the diffuse layer. So with these two, uh, the Faraday's constant f is actually absorbed. So in the non-dimensional form, you do not have the Faraday's constant. I think this was a mistake. In the last PPT, the Faraday's constant was shown. Okay, now please correct that. So the Faraday's constant is absorbed in the non-dimensional form. So now we um, write down the non-linear uh, non Poisson-Boltzmann equation in one direction that is along y we want to solve to get a profile along y. Okay. Uh, now what we do is to get an analytical solution, we can linearize it. So how do we uh, linearize it is uh, we replace, uh, you know, use, using Taylor series, your exponential uh, function can be replaced as, uh, you know, 1 plus x plus x square plus x cube and so on. So if your value of uh, um, y star, for example, or um, just let me go back. If your value of z i phi star, so within the exponential term is reasonably small, therefore you can neglect all the higher order terms okay, of z i phi star. So you can only retain 1 plus z i phi star. Okay. And when you substitute this uh, for the case of uh, um, Na plus Cl minus or K plus Cl minus, um, so where for example you have uh, the values of uh, z for Na plus same as that of Cl minus, you know, but only the opposite signs. So you have plus 1 and minus 1 and also the concentration is uh, similar for both of them. So in that case, uh, this term related to 1 will cancel off. So you have basically this value will be uh, 1 and uh, this is uh, 1 square. So the other case, it will be 1 um, and you have, uh, um, so you have 1 and uh, 1, the other one will be 1 and minus 1. Okay? So therefore that these two terms will cancel off. So therefore the term involving 1 will uh, disappear, only the term involving z i phi star will be there. Okay? So that should come to this particular form here, uh, right here. Okay? And from there, if you apply this for Na plus Cl minus or K plus Cl minus, so that should also uh, simplify to the following form. Is that clear? So that is how we reduce the nonlinear uh, Poisson-Boltzmann equation to a linear Poisson-Boltzmann equation. Now for which we can find an analytical solution in a straightforward manner. Okay? Any doubts on this? Okay? So therefore uh, now the generic solution will be in terms of exponential uh, plus uh, y star and the other is exponential minus y star. So we know that uh, in order to satisfy the case and phi star should be 0 at y star equal to infinity. So the term containing exponential uh, y star should disappear. Okay? So that means we have only an exponentially decaying function with respect to y, right? which uh, we can find out the constant by applying the other condition that at y equal to 0, your value of phi should be equal to phi naught star. That is the maximum value at the wall, maximum value of the excess potential. Okay? So from this, uh, therefore, we can also substitute this into the expression for concentration and find out how the concentration profile varies with respect to y, right? So therefore, this if you plot it, uh, you can see that phi is exponentially decaying function from the wall um, till it is about uh, you know uh, five times the d by length. So you should see that. Uh, exactly at the d by length your phi does not become equal to 0. right? So it takes some time beyond the d by length for the potential to completely excess potential to decay. And similarly with the concentration uh, profile also. So for example the Na plus concentration in this case will be very high right at the wall because of the negatively charged wall. Whereas the 
value of Cl minus will be deficient, will be very less compared to the bulk values. Okay, and these two show the the Boltzmann type uh, um, distribution and exponential decay, right from the wall to the bulk values. So therefore, um, now we therefore have the solution for phi, and we know how the phi actually varies with respect to y, and we also um, can find out the case where we apply an electric field. Okay, so far we have not applied electric field; everything was statics. We just solve for the static field. So now, once you apply the electric field, you should have a velocity profile, and how this velocity profile develops is now divided into an inner problem and the outer problem. So the inner problem consists only of the EDL where we solve the Navier-Stokes equation plus the Coulomb force, right? Which consists of the external field, and therefore the the Coulomb force here has the local charge density rho e times e external right so we can substitute for therefore rho e through the um, relation between rho and the electrostatic potential from the poisson equation so therefore for a simple case where we want to consider a fully developed steady state solution without pressure gradient okay just a flow past a flat plate with a dri driven by an external electric field so all the other gradients become zero only you have the diffusion in the vertical direction balanced by the coulomb force right so the other convective terms are are zero pressure gradient terms are zero so in this case uh, we substitute for rho in terms of phi and when we integrate it uh, we get the final solution for u in terms of phi and therefore when we apply the condition that at y equal to 0 your phi should be equal to phi naught uh, we get the velocity profile um, finally you know this is the inner velocity profile so therefore uh, you know this is the condition uh, this is the velocity profile in the inner layer or within the edl now if you want to find out the uh, value of velocity at the edge of the edl so at the edge of the edl you substitute the value of phi equal to 0 okay so therefore uh, the profile at the edge of the edl becomes um, minus epsilon phi naught into e divided by eta okay so all of you follow till here i think we covered this uh, in the last class i'm clarifying again so this will now become the boundary condition or the slip condition for the outer flow so in the outer flow it's the electro uh, statically neutral so you don't have the direct effect of the electric field on the outer flow okay so however at uh, the edge of the edl you have an induced motion due to the field and that is given as a provided as a slip boundary condition to the outer flow so the outer flow we just solve the routine navier stokes equation without any coulomb forces but provide this as the boundary condition at y equal to 0 so we assume now that y is shifted from the actual wall to the edge of the edl by the order of few tens of nanometers and the velocity profile at that location is given as the slip velocity okay so now for the simple case of uh, quad flow that is between two parallel plates which are both experiencing uh, the same value of coulomb force so what will be the limiting solution the entire profile will be the same as the boundary boundary profile so that means uh, we are talking about quad flow which is steady state um, and also uh, fully developed without any pressure gradient so in that case your velocity profile will have to satisfy the value at the boundaries right so the application of such a electro osmotic uh, phenomena is used in one of the ways of using this uh, in microfluidics is through what are called as electrokinetic pumps okay so in the conventional sense you use only pressure gradient to pump the fluid as a mechanical pump now you also have the electric field which is driving the flow so therefore um, we can write two expressions so one is the electro osmotic contribution which is driven by the electric field and that is coming from the velocity expression here so you have the corresponding flow rate by integrating this velocity profile across the channel 
channel cross section. The other is you can consider is a purely pressure gradient flow. Okay, so the actual uh, system could have both the pressure gradient terms and also the Coulomb force driving the flow. Okay, so if you don't have any Coulomb force, then your pure pressure gradient flow is your conventional flow between two parallel plates or flow in a channel. That is a completely pressure gradient flow. Okay, so that is your pressure driven flow uh, expression in the uh, second equation here. So your actual flow, total flow in the electrokinetic pumps, which have both the electroosmotic flow as well as the pressure gradient flow, is a sum of these two, these two terms. So therefore, if you integrate this across the channel cross section, you will be able to get the net flow rate, which is the first term is driven by the electrokinetics, second term is driven by the pressure gradient. So therefore, from this expression, you can get the case where your pressure gradient can be maximum and the case where your flow can be maximum. Okay? So for example, uh, the pressure gradient can be maximum for a case where you block the flow at the exit, so you do not uh, have an outlet. So the outlet flow is 0, so that in that case, for this case if you put Q equal to 0, you get an expression for uh, dP by dx in terms of uh, the electroosmotic velocity and therefore you get the expression which is given here, okay, where delta V is the voltage difference, that is your E, nothing but, but your E. So your E is nothing but delta V by L, right. So this is the case where you can get your maximum pressure rise. Okay. So the other case where you can get your maximum flow rate is the case where your dp by dx is 0 because these two are in the opposite directions. Okay, your pressure gradient is actually driving your flow in this direction as you can see the profile here whereas the electric field is driving the flow in the opposite direction. Okay. So if you want to get the maximum flow, so you have to set uh, dp by dx equal to 0 and it will be completely driven by only electrokinetics. Okay. So in that case the expression for Q max is um, given like this, right. So therefore you have expression for Q max, you have expression for delta P max depending on what kind of mode you want to operate. Okay. If you want to get a maximum pressure rise, you operate it in, in that mode. Okay. If you want to get maximum flow rate, you operate it in pure electroosmotic mode. And you can also define the efficiency of this pump as the pumping power divided by what is the power input. So power input is your electrical power. Okay. So that is your applied potential difference times your current. And your pumping power is your product of pressure drop and your volumetric flow rate. Okay. So usually if you calculate with these values, you know with these expressions for uh, delta P and Q, okay. so you can estimate your delta P from this expression for example and Q from this expression um, and you can substitute and check, uh, these will be of the order of 4 percent or 5 percent maximum. Okay. So if you use the value of delta P max and Q max, right, you will be able to predict what is the maximum thermodynamic efficiency you can get. So that will be of the order of 4 to 5 percent. So therefore they are not very high but nevertheless uh, instead of using mecha conventional mechanical pump at very small scales, it is very difficult to design a conventional mechanical pump at very small device, uh, microfluidic device scale. In that case you can use the electroosmotic phenomena to build a electrokinetic pump. Okay, even with lower efficiencies, it can uh, you know basically move the fluid and also cause a pressure difference. Sir, uh, so you can get a ball potential where uh, we get a, uh, come to the final uh, expression that uh, simply ball potential uh, by neglecting that uh, the concentration. Sir, is there any mathematical approximation by which we can neglect that uh, and give a approximation the concentration? Concentration where we are neglecting? Ah, okay. So in this case for uh, Na plus or Cl minus, 
So, your C i star infinity of N a plus and C l minus are same equimolar solutions. Same. Same. And then the value of uh, Z i square is also same you have uh, 1 and 1. So, therefore, so that part will simplify to this right. Okay. So, therefore, this is one phenomena in electro kinetics that is the electro osmotic flow. So, in which uh, you are able to cause the motion of the bulk fluid okay, due to the charge concentration close to the wall by an applied external field. Now, the other phenomena is where the ions themselves move okay, with the bulk fluid being stationary okay. or you can also imagine that if you have small particles okay these pa particles can gather some charge so they will never be perfectly electrically neutral they will be either having a positive or negative charge so these will form an electric double layer the same way that we have shown for the uh, previous case so they will attract the counter uh, charges from the bulk fluid and they will form the electric double layer around this particular particle and now if you apply an electric field in a stationary fluid okay so you will find these particles are actually migrating and moving okay so this is uh, different from the electro uh, osmos osmosis in the electro osmosis when with the applied external field the entire bulk flow seems to move but in this case only the particles will be moving and the bulk flow appears to be stationary okay so so this is mostly related to particles and sometimes people refer this to as particle electrophoresis okay and also there is a because of the motion of these particles there is a concentration gradient again okay. there is a so there is a, if, if you have species different kinds of species then again you have uh, a concentration gradient and a field setup being set up okay now how do we analyze the uh, case of uh, forces on the um, particles and similarly how do we get the velocity of these particles. So, this is now done in a very similar fashion as the electro osmosis. So, only you can um, assume the field to uh, act in an opposite direction um, as in the previous case because in the earlier case we were looking at uh, the case where your plate is stationary right the wall is stationary and then the ions are actually moving. Okay, because of the applied external field. Now, in this case you can make an approximation that your um, bulk fluid is stationary and the wall is now moving. Okay. So, in this case uh, we can impose a electric field in the opposite direction as the previous case. So, you will get the same solution here only the signs will be reversed you will have phi naught minus phi because in this particular um, expression you will have a plus here because of the opposite sign of the electric field. Okay. So, in the previous case your uh, viscous diffusion is happening in um, uh, the opposite direction as the applied coulomb force now this will be both in the same direction. So, you will have a positive sign. So, it is just uh, changing the coordinate frame of reference. So, in the previous case we had a fixed coordinate frame of reference okay. the wall is also fixed and then the the bulk fluid is moving. So, now in this case the particle is moving the bulk fluid is stationary. So, now we fix the coordinate to the particle. So, it becomes similar to the earlier case where the wall is stationary bulk fluid is moving, but the electric field is acting in the opposite direction. So, the same expression can be uh, used for uh, velocity only we replace the um, uh, potential uh, um, I mean with minus sign. Okay. So, the same expression, but uh, instead of using um, epsilon phi naught eta e, we have a, a minus there, and we replace that with a plus sign here, right? So this was this was your earlier expression. We just replace that with a positive sign in this case. So is that clear? So this is the uh, very simplistic approximation, and this is particularly valid for a case where you have a thin EDL, right? So if you have a thin EDL case where the radius of the particle or diameter of the particle is much larger than the d by length. So, you can apply the same velocity because locally compared to the curvature, the curvature appears 
to be very small for the bulk fluid. So therefore, this will be almost like a flow past a flat plate case, right? And you also have the EDL which is very thin and we can assume that both the EDL as well as the particle is moving with the same velocity, right? If you have a much thicker EDL, so that is a thick EDL case. So first of all, the electric field itself will not be uniform because uh, now the D by layer is quite thick, okay? And also there will be a variation in the velocity of um, the particle. So there will be a drag force between the particle and the actual EDL, okay? So therefore, um, in this case, we multiply the previous expression for the thick EDL case with the correction factor F, okay? So the earlier case is uh, the same expression as what, what we have derived for electroosmotic flow for flow past a plate. The same expression is used, only we change the sign. But if you have a thick EDL, okay, there will be a considerable slip effect between the EDL and the particle itself. So therefore, you have to correct the velocity by means of a correction factor, multiplicative factor. Okay. So therefore, um, uh, if you have also have a bulk motion that maybe it could be due to the pumping uh, power or whatever externally. So therefore, the total velocity of the ion or the particle can be equal to both the bulk velocity plus, so you have to do a vector sum, okay. depends on what direction your electric field is applied and what direction the bulk fluid is moving. Okay. You cannot always do a plus, you have to be careful, it, it should be a vector summation. Okay. So therefore, uh, you have a vector summation of both the particle uh, motion as well as the bulk fluid motion, right? So now if you want to solve for the concentration in this case, okay, the earlier case, the static case, we just assume an exponential uh, decay in the concentration from the wall because there, the static case, there was no fluid motion. So now if you are talking about the particle which is also migrating. So therefore, it will also have advection component as well as a diffusion component. So you have to solve for both of them and in the advection component, your velocity now will have both the uh, velocity of the bulk fluid, the sum of the bulk fluid velocity plus your uh, particle migration velocity due to the electrophoresis. So both of this will contribute and therefore, we write the equation for the advection diffusion equation for the concentration of the species and this uh, equation is called the nurst planck equation. So very commonly in uh, microfluidics, when people want to solve for concentration uh, distribution okay, and also where you have the electrokinetic effects. So they have to calculate uh, both the electrophoretic, the, the electro Poritic velocity as well as the bulk velocity and do a vector sum and use that in the advection part and the other part is the diffusion part which is the routine diffu diffusivity of these species and they solve this partial differential equation to describe the evolution of the concentration of uh, uh, you know this particular species over time. Okay. So this is a very popular equation and this does not have any chemical reaction. If you also have chemical reactions, then you have appropriate source and sink terms. So this, this equation is called the, the nurst planck equation and people generally solve this. So apart from your uh, electrophoretic uh, uh, velocities, uh, you also solve the nurst planck equation to look at the distribution of uh, some ions or particles or some chemical species uh, in a bulk fluid. Okay. So, so these two, uh, whatever we have covered, the electrophoresis as well as the electroosmosis. So these two are the most uh, fundamental electrokinetic phenomena. Although they appear to be similar, so one, you know, we have a frame of reference um, in which your wall is fixed and fluid is moving, the other, the fluid is moving and the wall is fixed. Okay. But uh, it, it can be um, applied to two different things. So one where we have only um, a, a fluid uh, with setting up an electrical double layer and the complete motion of this fluid. The other where we have a particle diffusion okay, and the motion of these particles uh, due to applied electric field. So one example could be if you suspend say nanoparticles okay, or micron sized particles. So you can actually 
observe the electrophoresis phenomena more than your electroosmosis. Okay. So, also although the base fluid will set up the EDL and there could be some motion, but uh, these particles will migrate more rapidly than the base fluid and therefore, in such cases where you have suspensions in liquids, you will observe the electrophoresis uh, you know uh, more commonly than electroosmosis. But these two can exist together. Okay. So, therefore, I, I will stop uh, our discussion on the electrokinetics here. There are also some, some other parts of electrokinetics um, as I talked about the other effect where we uh, move and then this motion can create an electric field and that is called the streaming and sedimentation potential. Okay. So, we will start the next topic. Uh, so, so far we have uh, in, in micro scale um, heat transfer we started uh, with the single phase um, gas flows, then we talked about uh, single phase liquid flows and associated with the liquid flows we also looked at the electrokinetics. So, now what is again very important uh, in heat transfer is the phase change, phase change process it could be we can also call this as two phase flows to be very generic because two phase can be without phase change right you can have a liquid air system okay which is a common two phase flow in mini or micro channels or you can also heat the system it's a non isothermal or a non adiabatic system which could also result in a change of phase okay from the liquid to vapor so in this case typically we are talking about um, it could be a single component phase change or multi component phase change is more complicated because you have in the vapor phase you have also water vapor plus air. Okay. So, when we are talking about phase change we, we are mostly talking about the single component phase change that we, we that means we have only one element water in, in, in its uh, elemental liquid form or it could be in the vapor form or if you are talking generally about two phase it can also include non uh, adiabatic uh, mixture of air and water. Okay. So, that will also be a classical two phase problem. So, in either case now what is the reason to go to study phase change in mini and micro channels. Okay. So, like your conventional macro channels, uh, macro channels or uh, macro ducts. So, you have uh, problems of heat exchanges at very small scales also. Okay. So, you may not talk about heat exchanges directly in micro fluidics, but uh, in electronic cooling applications for example, you want to put very small heat exchanges where the diameter of these ducts can approach order of few microns. Okay. So, in that case suppose there is an evaporation process or a condensation process. Okay. How does the flow regime look? So, it, it appears that the flow regimes although there is some commonality between your macro channel phase change and micro channel phase change. So, the regimes are quite distinct in the case some of the regimes are quite unique and distinct to the micro channel which is which are totally absent in the macro channel case. And these are partly due to the enhanced capillary effects appearing at micro channel case okay. and also the confinement uh, to the growth of the vapor bubbles due to the smaller diameters. So, this confinement also brings in uh, the distinct flow regimes. So, let us focus therefore, on the flow regimes when you have phase change at micro and mini channels and therefore, associated with that what is the consequence on the pressure drop and heat transfer. So, these are the two important parameters when we study the phase change problem. So, therefore, um, when we talk about two phase flows you can have either a simultaneous flow of liquid and vapor of a single substance that is a single component or it could be two different substances or two different components and this may be a general two phase flow. Okay. So, and this could therefore, exist either in the adiabatic case or with only with heat transfer. So, you can see this effect everywhere you know common two phase flows are everywhere every flow in uh, atmospheric science. Um, what you see in uh, real life problem every everywhere you find two phase flows for example, fog, smoke, you have clouds, you have uh, uh, quicksand. So, this in this case you have uh, a solid liquid mixture 
okay. So, it is not a liquid air or liquid vapor mixture. You have boiling water, you have coffee percolator, uh, blood milk. So, all these are two phase flows. You have more than one component and more than one phase, right. So, where are all these applications of uh, generic two phase flows? They are they can be applied anywhere as you as you can see from atmospheric sciences to heat exchangers to wherever you need uh, efficient cooling systems. So, everywhere they can be applied, right. So, if you talk about therefore, two phase flow applications particularly in micro conduits. That means, I am not talking about uh, uh, phase change here, just, just simple um, two phase flow, okay, two different liquids, two different phases or whatever. So, you can talk about uh, micro reactors where you have one drop embedded in the other drop and you can use this for generating some chemical reactions, okay. So, the application could be um, some small micro chemical reactors or it could be a biological or medical application. So, where you want to introduce a small uh, drug targeted to a cell and this drug reacts only within that cell and not everywhere, okay. So, in that case uh, you can syn synthesize uh, a drop which is of a different density and viscosity which is sitting inside a larger drop of a different viscosity and density. So, you can produce some flow regimes with this kind of a distribution, okay. You can also talk about uh, dosing reagents into droplets in micro channels. So, that means uh, with some diffusion properties uh, in either chemical reactors or in medical applications, you can inject some dye or selectively only and look at how they diffuse within this particular uh, droplet, okay. So, so this uh, dye could be a, a liquid or a vapor, okay. Again, this is a distinct two phase application and you can also have chemical reactions by merging droplets. So, you can have one um, could be a, a, a medicine, okay. So, or drug which you inject as a liquid into the uh, blood stream and then it will be uh, reacting with uh, some other component of the blood which is again a different liquid and these two will have a chemical reaction and they can have merging of these drops. So, you have two phase flow applications everywhere generically, but what we are particularly concerned here is the non adiabatic uh, case that is a, a phase change uh, due to flow boiling or condensation, okay. So, so this kind of two phase um, applications are primarily in the area of electronic cooling, right. So, the electronic cooling applications and some of the MEMS applications also where you need to build small heat exchangers require dissipation of very high heat fluxes and therefore, we try to use micro channels. And why do we again go for micro channel two phase flows? The same justification that we gave for going for micro channels with even the single phase, okay. So, for the same Nusselt number you have a high heat transfer coefficient as your channel diameter comes down, okay. So, that is one reason why micro channels are very attractive uh, for heat transfer applications, okay. Now, when you look at phase change you know that even with the macro channel case your phase change heat transfer coefficients are at least uh, 2 to 3 orders of magnitude higher than the single phase heat transfer coefficient. So, that means if you are talking about uh, macro channel where the single phase heat transfer is uh, coefficient is of the order of 10 or you know 20 watts per meter square Kelvin. Your phase change heat transfer coefficient if you have boiling can be of the order of 10 power 3 watt per meter square Kelvin in the uh, in the nucleate boiling regime. Now, if you go to micro channel this value of single phase H will would have already gone up by it say 10 times, right. So, from say 10 or 20 it would have gone to 100 or 200, while you know the boiling heat transfer coefficient can actually go to the order of 10 power 3 or 10 power 4 sometimes even in micro channels, okay. So, therefore, compared to your single phase heat transfer always your phase change has a higher value of H. So, uh, whether you are constructing um, a micro heat exchanger to dissipate heat from an electronic chip or a MEMS device it is always attractive to operate this in the phase change regime rather than single phase regime, okay. 
So therefore, phase change applications are um, quite, uh, I mean, uh, 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 more in demand than the single phase application. And at the same time, the the flow and uh, flow physics and heat transfer is also more challenging and complex. Okay, so. So what is basically the fundamental difference between macro and micro channel is that if you look at the effect of surface tension forces, so they, they become more dominant in micro channel compared to the gravity which is more dominant in the macro channel case. So because of this when you pass liquid flow at the inlet of a, a macro channel and you start heating this with a constant heat flux. So you would see uh, the different flow regime starting from a pure liquid at the inlet and at the exit it will be pure vapor and intermediate you will find flows such as bubbly flow, coalesced flow, confined bubble slug flow, annular slug flow and so on. And provides uh, this also depends on what is the orientation of this tube. So if it is vertically oriented you see these regimes. If you horizontally orient it then you can see stratification that means the denser fluid will settle down lighter fluid will go up. So the effect of gravity becomes very important. Whereas in the case of micro channel whether you orient it uh, you know in a vertical manner or a horizontal manner it is relatively insensitive to the orientation because the gravity forces are very small compared to the surface tension force. And mostly you will find these bubbles cannot keep growing at the same um, uh, diameter as in the macro channel therefore the bubble sizes will be much longer. Um, much smaller and also they will be elongated. So most of the uh, regimes are confined to the bubbly flow regime but these are uh, slightly longer than in the macro channel and these are called as uh, Taylor bubble flow or slug flow. Okay. So therefore the dry out happens in a different manner in the micro channel compared to macro channel case. In the macro channel case uh, you can have all these bubbles, bubbles which are slightly expanded and then um, finally you know close to the wall you have the film and the film also finally evaporates and then you have a complete dry out. So in the case of micro channel you know right from um, close to the inlet all the way you have the bubbly regime. So bubbles only keep elongating more and more and more but the thin film will keep sticking for a longer period of time and finally the film also ruptures evaporates and you have a complete dry out. Okay. So the, therefore the mechanism of heat transfer is quite uh, different. So in, in the micro channel case the heat transfer is mostly through the film, the thin film because the, uh, the bubble al already stretches and elongates much earlier than in the macro channel case. So therefore the thin film plays a very important role through which the heat is added from the wall into the bubble. Okay. So the other parts uh, related to the flow regimes we will continue tomorrow um, and also the corresponding um, expressions for pressure drop and heat transfer coefficient. So I, I hope to uh, uh, talk about this for another two classes and complete this by the week okay, so that next week we move on to nanofluids. All right, so we will stop here.